Welcome again to Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. Jim Caruso, today I am coming to you from Hanoi. The, my, first, uh, my first visit to Hanoi uh, actually was in 1999, but I came here in 2013 uh, to work in the embassy. And at the time, things were still kind of abuzz with the idea of this pivot to Asia. And I think that we have some folks who, who could talk pretty, pretty eloquently to that topic. We certainly do, Ray. Uh, we're really very pleased to have with us the authors of a new book called The Lost Decade about the so-called pivot to Asia. Ambassador Robert Blackwell and Richard Fontaine. Uh, Bob uh, was ambassador to India under uh, President Bush II. He was uh, at the NSC and now he's a senior fellow at Carnegie, uh, I'm sorry, the Center, uh, the Council for Foreign Relations. Richard Fontaine heads up CNAS, uh, Center for New American Security. He worked for Senator McCain as an advisor to the Senate. Uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So these guys know foreign policy. And their new book, The Lost Decade, is number one on the Amazon International Relations list since it came out a couple of weeks ago, as well it should be. So we've been talking about the pivot for a long time, as you describe in your book. Um, now you guys wrote a book about this question again. Why should anyone care about something we've been talking about all these years, and which really hasn't happened? Why should we care about the pivot and this lost decade? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, the story of the pivot is uh, distressing uh, in many ways. And uh, perhaps one should say what it was before one says it's important. So in uh, the fall of 2011, Hillary Clinton wrote a 5,000 word plus uh, essay in Foreign Policy magazine in which uh, she indicated a uh, major change in U.S. grand strategy. The United States had always been a Europe first uh, power, and she said that uh, from now on, uh, Asia would be uh, the most important priority for the United States. Uh, Richard and I agreed uh, then and uh, agree now that that was the right uh, posture for the administration to take, uh, but it never happened, as you said, and its consequences live uh, till today, because while we didn't increase our resources, our diplomacy, our economic policies, our military forces uh, to Asia during the 2010s, thus the lost decade, we had at the same time an astonishing rise in Chinese power, in military power, in economic power, and in diplomatic influence. So we ended the 2010s in a weaker position in Asia than when Hillary Clinton wrote that essay. So it's pertinent today, and we argue at the end of the book that, well, we haven't pivoted so far, but we should pivot now and explain why and how. I would just add that the reason we should care about the pivot is essentially the same reason we should care about the Indo-Pacific. So um, the, the title of your your podcast is quite apt in that respect. The Indo-Pacific is the region of the world with the greatest demographic weight, the greatest economic gravity, uh, the most uh, economic and technolo technological opportunities. Um, it's the area of greatest uh, geopolitical competition. And of course, it's the region in which China, America's foremost geopolitical competitor uh, and the only country in the world with the will and the strength to upend key elements of global order is resident and most active. So um, the effort to focus a greater share of US foreign policy on the Indo-Pacific uh, should be self-evident, um, but the attempt to do that over the years has been, as we can talk about, bedeviled by all kinds of things, including events in other regions. 
So I'm glad you brought that up, uh, Robert, because, you know, when I got here to Hanoi in 2013, I had just come out of a deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. And of course, we were very focused on Afghanistan. We were still fighting this war on terror. And I do recall that there was this long period of time when, as a nation, we held out hope that our relationship with China would be different, that China would be different. That I, I recall the term responsible stakeholder that came out of that first Bush administration we talked about, or the second Bush administration that we talked about. And we held on to that idea for a very long time. Why didn't that happen? Well, uh, your, your analysis and uh, conclusion is absolutely right. And we argue in the book in great detail that uh, one of the reasons uh, that the failed pivot uh, is so consequential, but also occurred, is that it took us uh, so long to recognize and internalize that Bob Zelig's aspiration that China would become a, a responsible sh uh, sh uh, stakeholder simply wasn't going to happen. And indeed, that uh, Xi Jinping had the uh, opposite uh, grand strategy, which was to replace the United States as the uh, most important and influential uh, power in Asia and eventually beyond. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, held out hope uh, far longer than we should have. And then even when we recognized it, which was finally explicitly in the Trump administration, uh, uh, that uh, China was, uh, as uh, Richard just said, uh, intent on uh, disrupting world order, even to today, even to today, we're doing too little, far too little to respond to that uh, threat. So, you know, we were certainly behind the curve, but I have to say, given my experience in the region, I'm reminded of when uh, Richard came out, when I first, we first met in Australia in 2016. And you may remember, Richard, the Australians kept saying, don't make us choose between our security partner and our trade partner. Don't make us say anything negative about China. And I heard the same thing across Southeast Asia, which we still hear. So it's very hard to lead when no one will follow. Um, is that part of the problem? that we, China's rise was accompanied by this huge trade and investment relationship with China among our allies and friends. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember um, that meeting fondly uh, in 2016. We met for the first time in Australia and it was a different time in Australia and the way that Australia thought about China. The line was exactly what you said, which was, you know, we have a great security partner in America and a great trade and investment partner in China. Um, sentiment there has significantly changed over the years as uh, Chinese intervention in Australian domestic politics, their um, embargoing of, of uh, barley and wine and things like that uh, uh, recurred after Australia had the temerity to call for an investigation into COVID's origins and things like that. And you see that pattern repeated around the region. So countries that in the 2016 timeframe aspired to a productive, certainly economic relationship, and maybe beyond with China, have a lot of ways been sort of mugged uh, by the reality of, of Chinese behavior. Um, that said, as you, as you noted, there's plenty of countries in the region today whose mantra is, don't make us choose. We don't want to get caught between the United States and China. We want, and they would say this maybe not as explicitly, but we want a mix of security and economic benefits from both and don't want to have to give up those benefits from either. And the reality is neither the United States nor China is asking these countries to make one big overarching strategic choice. You can only trade, invest, and have security relationships with us, or you can only have it with the other one. I mean, the United States wouldn't sign up to that given our extensive economic relationship with China. But there's many specific zero-sum choices that both countries are leaning on third countries to make. China wants countries to buy Huawei. The United States does not. 
China would like to have military installations and countries the United States would like them not to have. You know, you can go on and on and on. And on all those issues, countries are inevitably having to choose. And those choices are only going to get more difficult. Let me just chime in and say, and as uh, uh, an experienced diplomat, you'll recognize this. Well, that was inherent in the uh, pivot that uh, our friends and partners and allies in Asia would worry that we were going to try to force them to choose. Well, as uh, diplomats, how would one deal with that? Well, you would deal with it by consultation before the announcement. And you'd say, you would say, uh, I know you're going to have this concern, but we really want to stress to you before this becomes public that we're not going to ask you to choose. There was no consultation with our allies about the pivot before it happened. And so when it happened, uh, the Australians and uh, all uh, the rest of our friends and allies uh, in uh, the Middle East, in Europe, and in the Indo-Pacific uh, did what ambassadors do. They raced into their favorite friend in the State Department or White House and said, what does the pivot mean? And if Asia's number one, who's number two? And what does that mean? And the administration had no answers. So this abiding concern in all three regions, in Asia, that uh, will force them to choose or try, in Europe, that the pivot meant a reduction in the U.S. commitment to defend Europe, and in the Middle East, the, it propelled forward a view that was already present everywhere in the Middle East, that the Americans were going home. So we got the worst diplomatic reaction to the pivot while we're not pivoting. Well, that brings us to the question of what would, given all of these uh, contingencies that continue to happen in these, you know, what, what are supposed to be secondary and even tertiary theaters, what would a properly executed pivot have looked like had we done it correctly? Uh, uh, some of the initial aspirations set out for the pivot were the right ones then and are the right ones now. We've belatedly done some of them, um, including during the Biden administration, but um, certainly not all of them. So, uh, for example, uh, there was, as we all know, a major economic uh, centerpiece to the pivot. That was the Trans-Pacific Partnership Act. That went kaput in 2016 when it was caught up in presidential politics and President Trump pulled the United States out of that. The U.S. has had nothing to real uh, to sort of replace it or offer as an alternative, but a major economic component and a major trade component to the pivot then and one now is the right way to move. The, uh, the idea of shifting military resources from Europe and the Middle East, especially air and maritime resources, is the right one. Um, the Air Force and the Navy announced that henceforth 60% of their forces would be stationed in the Indo-Pacific. That was a nice number, but the Navy was shrinking at the time. And you overlaid sequestration, the Budget Control Act that whacked $500 billion out of the defense budget. And you had a shrinking pie for everybody. So even if Asia got a smaller, uh, larger slice, then that didn't work. We need a significantly increased defense budget given what's happening in the world in multiple regions today and a bigger share of those resources uh, for Asia than exists today. And then sustained diplomacy. We looked at the diplomacy, whether you measure it by quality or quantity over the years, and it was kind of all over the place in intensity, depending on who was Secretary of State, who was Assistant Secretary, who was National Security Advisor, what their own priorities were uh, under Hillary Clinton and our friend Kirk Campbell, it really uh, spiked. And then, in the, you know, when John Kerry came in with other priorities, especially in the Middle East, it went down. The Trump administration was all over the place. Um, so sustained diplomacy. Uh, you put those things together and we would be off and running uh, with some other things toward a, a latter-day pivot. 
So in your book, you know, you do a great job explaining what we want to do, why we failed. And then you go into four principles and nine items on the to-do list of what we should do now. And what interested me most about your principles include things like articulate a positive vision, which means take action, positive action, which can't just be telling a story about democracy, clearly, especially given the regimes and among some of our friends. Endorse America's global role, another one, which of course implies that we need to prioritize in a way that doesn't ignore things like Gaza and Ukraine, which are huge resource sucks, while still adding more resources to Asia in the time of constrained resources. And uh, we have to maintain our global commitments in this circumstance. So how, how under these principles would you, with that policy it look when we have apparently increasing isolationist United States in a resource constrained environment? Well, uh, you put your finger on uh, an enormous challenge for a global power. Uh, Richard and I uh, do not associate ourselves with the school that says, China, 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 leave Europe to the Europeans, leave uh, the Middle East to those folks and concentrate uh, all your will and resources and so forth uh, on uh, the Indo-Pacific and uh, on uh, dealing with China. Uh, we don't agree with that because we have vital national interests in both Europe and the Middle East. So how to do this and what our research revealed, and I, I believe that uh, it is uh, decisive in this respect, uh, that uh, it is not so much with our allies in either Europe, but especially the Middle East, that they count the number of platforms and uh, troops and air wings and bases to decide uh, the quality of the American commitment. It's much more to do with uh, the quality of our diplomacy and our decision-making, much more. For example, uh, we had uh, two presidents who drew red lines in the Middle East, uh, one of uh, Syria using uh, chemical weapons against its own citizens, and one uh, uh, President Trump uh, declaring a red line on Iranian attacks on uh, Saudi oil facilities. They drew those red lines in public and then didn't honor them when they were breached. So uh, the quality of diplomacy means an enormous amount here. And we think it's, it means more uh, than uh, simple platforms, as I, as I said. And the 2010s were not the best decade for quality American diplomacy. We're not genetically unable to have quality diplomacy, but we do have uh, 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 periods in which uh, it's uh, inferior. And I think uh, it was inferior, the diplomacy, and the book tries to make this point, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, 2010s. That began to change with President Biden. And uh, there were steps under uh, uh, the president and uh, engineered uh, and driven, uh, importantly, by Kurt Campbell. But then there was uh, the 2022 invasion of, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine and the Gaza crisis. But still, we think that we can withdraw the air and naval, uh, substantially draw, withdraw them from Europe and the Middle East. In Europe, we're not facing the Red Army. Uh, this is not the Red Army. And in the Middle East, as we did uh, right after the Gaza crisis began, we can surge forces uh, to the Middle East. And we're doing that even as we speak today, worrying about a, uh, a, a major war between Hezbollah and, uh, and Israel. 
So diplomacy matters a lot in how uh, uh, the pivot is perceived and whether we can uh, restore the confidence of our allies and friends in the reliability and resolve of the United States. So as we're talking about the confidence of our allies and partners, there's also the confidence of the People's Republic of China, which appears to be growing very rapidly. Uh, and we see the confidence expressed in aggressiveness, especially these days in places like the East and South China Seas, where it, it appears that China believes strongly that it has gained both the will and the right and perhaps also the and the capacity to push America out. And ultimately, there is a certain element of that come, that that comes down to hard power and hard power uh, consistently pushed into that theater by the United States of America. And as we speak, we have recently been surging power back toward the Middle East with the carrier group moving back toward the Red Sea away from the Indo-Pacific. You talked before about the need to address the defense budget. What is it about the budget that really needs to be addressed in order to be able to deter this kind of aggression in the Indo-Pacific? Well, first of all, um, look at the level of defense spending today relative to where it's been in history. We're at about 3% of GDP in defense spending. Uh, last time we were around that level was 1999. That was the height of the peace dividend at the end of the Cold War. Um, previous to that, we dipped down about that low in 1953 at the end of the Korean War. Um, but of course, we're looking at a world where the demand for U.S. defense resources is higher than it has been in a very long time. Wars raging in Europe and in the Middle East and a real need to increase deterrence in the Indo-Pacific because what we have witnessed over the previous decade plus is a deterioration in the military balance away from the United States and its allies and toward China. We've got one chart in our book that shows about 20 years ago, the United States had 150 more ships than China. Then we hit sort of zero to zero. And in a few years, China will have 150 more ships in the United States. I mean, numbers matter uh, when it comes to some of these things, particularly in the air and maritime domains, and particularly when you're trying to deter the war uh, that you wish uh, to avoid in the first place and to do so without capitulation. So we need a significant increase in defense, uh, the defense budget and defense resources. We need to look hard at what we're spending those dollars on. Um, so that we can maximize uh, power projection in ways that are going to not be uh, as vulnerable uh, to Chinese um, uh, potential attack as some of our platforms and assets have been in the past. So that gets to sort of the concept of what we're doing out there. Um, and then, as Bob was saying, uh, we need to look at shifting particularly air and maritime resources from the Middle East and Europe. So a bigger pie of resources overall and a bigger slice for the Indo-Pacific, um, because at the end of the day, we have to deter war with China. I mean, this is not uh, this would not be like fighting the Taliban or Saddam Hussein. If, God forbid, we actually found ourselves in a dust up with the People's Republic of China, uh, this would be a, a catastrophic state of affairs. And so um, you know, doing some, uh, doing more on the front end resource wise uh, can reduce the likelihood of, of a catastrophic set of costs down the line. You know, a major thesis of your book is that, as it's in the title, we lost a decade, but now the sense of urgency is really there because we have to catch up. Do you guys see that sense of urgency? I see it in a few places um, because there's things that are happening now that at least politically would have been impossible a few years ago. So you would not have been able to get $50 billion of taxpayer money for semiconductor production in the United States a few years ago. But there's a sense of urgency that we've got to do that now because the competition with China requires it. If you go back a few years before that. You wouldn't have gotten bipartisan support for the Build Act and the establishment of a development finance corporation and things like that. <clears throat> um, if you look at the Congress today, um, despite the fact that the 
the uh, administration turned in a flat, if not declining in real terms, defense budget. The Congress is moving to plus that up. But I would say that those so far are the politically easier things to do. We are still unable as a political system to do the politically difficult things and in some ways some of the most important things, right? So we still have no trade policy because of the domestic politics of trade. Um, so everyone seems to recognize that in the Indo-Pacific, trade policy is foreign policy. It's economically valuable to us, but it also signals uh, economic leadership, engagement, strategic prioritization. China's party to two of the trans Asian, or is party to one RCEP of the pan-regional trade agreements is applied to join the other uh, CPTPP. The United States is party to neither, wishes to join neither, and uh, is offering nothing really by way of alternative. We don't have a uh, strategic immigration policy that would pave the way for the best contributors to our economy, including those who come and are educated in the United States, to stay and contribute to our innovation as opposed to return to their own countries or even go to China. So there's some things that are in the area of they weren't were once more or less unthinkable. And now the sense of urgency has made them doable, but not the hardest stuff. And what we need to get on with is the hardest things. And those are the things we need to uh, to start doing today. So that brings us back to, you know, what we were talking about when we're talking about the American people and what their priorities are. And, you know, we saw this in vivid technicolor with this 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 thing that you, you talked about, uh, Richard, which is uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, where all of us in our foreign policy ivory towers came up with this great idea to do this big international trade deal. And somehow the American people did not see it through the same goggles as we did. And by the time we got to the election in 2016, neither party was interested in the deal that we helped, well, that we basically authored from the United States perspective. And so we, we, we got this thing ready to go and we brought it and then we walked away from it. And so it brings us to the question of now we know, let's say we in our ivory tower here, uh, know what, think we know what we need to do, but the American people may not be on board. We just had a, a presidential debate last night. And from what I can tell, uh, although I frankly couldn't bring myself to watch the whole thing, uh, it, this was not a topic of conversation. The word Taiwan did not come up, but they definitely spent time talking about golf. So, you know, what is it that what is it that's going to get the American people behind something that we can actually execute? I mean, what is it that's going to inspire our political class to carry forth this this imperative if the American people don't seem interested? Well, I, I think there are two big things. One uh, is uh, more likely uh, than the other. The first is uh, Xi Jinping. And he will increasingly, as you said at the outset, uh, give the American people and uh, their leadership reasons to accelerate uh, our efforts, uh, widen, deepen our efforts to deal with the rise of China. He seems uh, oblivious to the effects uh, on uh, our allies in Asia and in Europe, whose uh, policies toward China are, as we know, in major transition, uh, much more skeptical than before. So uh, that, I think, uh, is on the plus side. Uh, less certain, to put it mildly, is presidential leadership. And it is telling that in this period since uh, the announcement of the pivot to Asia, that no American president has put his shoulder to the wheel in a sustained way in order to persuade the American people of the validity of this idea and to explain why it is crucial to their future. None has ever done that, partly uh, because they uh, have kept uh, being distracted 
part of its domestic politics, as we've just been saying, especially in the trade area. Uh, but that's going to be required uh, for uh, the president uh, to uh, uh, to continually make the argument to the American people. As, by the way, uh, George W. Bush did after 9-11 uh, on the global war on terror. He didn't just give one speech about that. He talked about it in every single press conference almost no matter what the question was, he answered uh, on the global war on terror. Uh, so that will be required, whether either of the current presidential candidates will be willing to do that, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, certainly, I agree absolutely that uh, last night and the debate uh, was not encouraging in that regard, but uh, we'll have uh, a, a new administration uh, one way or the other in Washington in January, and we just hope the combination of a second term in which presidents have more flexibility than in first term, they don't have to run again, and China's aggressive behavior will produce a better context for presidential leadership and implementation of what a consensus in America now uh, accepts that uh, we have to do much more to deal with China's systematic day-by-day -day effort to upturn uh, global order. In my experience in Asia, I would always hear China doing a very effective job of saying, we are in Asia. We will always be in Asia. We will always be interested in Asia. While Americans are always interested in the next shiny object or issue du jour. And I'm afraid that we keep proving them right in many ways. As you said, the Biden administration has tried to focus more on Asia, but still without the trade policy, as Richard said, one of the most important aspects of any relationship in Asia is the trade and investment relationship. So we failed there. We have been perceived as uh, refocusing on Europe and Middle East to some degree. And, and finally, this whole question in the Philippines about whether the mutual defense treaty should take effect or not in the face of Chinese aggression against the Philippines is going to be a major test of what they're seeing as U.S. reliability. So uh, given that, do you feel like we're almost at a tipping point of uh, trust in the U.S., especially given the elections coming up? I, I would say two things about this. One, um, a strategy to put Asia first in our grand strategy, which is something that we tried to develop in this book, cannot presume that the rest of the world is just going to stay put and quiet while we finally are able to pivot to Asia. You know, any strategy has to be realistic, both about American interests and inevitable events and crises and things in other parts of the world, especially in Europe and the Middle East. So um, that's when, you know, you've talked about the allocation of military resources, for example, you can um, have things in the Indo-Pacific that get surged into other regions, but you can't pretend like the Middle East is just going to quiet down and that American pre or that American presidents won't care about it anymore uh, or things will happen in Europe and, and we'll just say, well, let's just let the, the friendly locals sort that out. And because, you know, uh, we're really focused on Asia. So we have to have a strategy that, that deals with the world as it is and as it will be, but nevertheless prioritizes the Asia theater of operations. And I think that can be done. With respect to uh, what's happening on Second Time of Shoal uh, off the coast of the Philippines, I mean, this is sort of the, the the flashpoint right now. And I think there's some really difficult days ahead, specifically here. I mean, you talk to, you talk about, you know, the interests of the American people. I don't think I could find anybody in my own neighborhood who would know where Second Time of Shoal is. And if I explained to them that there was a rusting hulk of an old American ship that's there that gets resupplied every couple of weeks by, you know, the Philippine uh, 
Navy and that this is a Philippine claim and they're EEZ and all this other stuff. I think people, you know, would start to roll their eyes. Nevertheless, we have said that the mutual defense agreement with the Philippines encompasses things like uh, resistance to armed aggression at places like Second Thomas Shoal. And the Chinese are actively contesting this right now as we speak. Uh, and so, you know, there is a, a serious uh, credibility issue for the United States and its network of alliances and exactly how those alliances apply and what the United States is prepared to do or not do in order to defend our allies when they come under aggression, whether it's water cannons or something more significant. And uh, so, you know, I think there, there there's a, a real test right now uh, and over the next few weeks. Um, and I think China quite clearly would like to force that issue on the hopes that we back down and they can say, see, you know, the Americans talk a good game, but when push comes to shove, as you said, you know, we're here and they are far away. Let me just add that uh, the question does arise, as you imply, how did we get here? And some counterfactuals uh, come to mind. Um, would we be in this situation if the United States had not passively accepted the militarization of the South China Sea in these artificial uh, islands uh, and instead contested it, had challenged uh, China uh, and its commitment by its president not to do it. And uh, we're here to some degree because we didn't challenge it and uh, we'll see how we challenge it now. But that lesson uh, also applies uh, a couple of other places of crucial importance to the United States. There is a counterfactual that's asked, would Vladimir Putin have invaded Ukraine if the United States had reacted in 2014 when he annexed Crimea as it did in 2022. Uh, because again, we essentially did nothing, were distracted and uh, didn't obviously sufficiently respond. And then to go to the Middle East, we're where we are now because successive American administrations have not figured out how to deal with Iran's uh, sanctuary as it uh, arms its uh, proxies to the teeth to kill, disrupt in the Middle East. And we haven't figured out to, how to do that. And uh, one option that does come to mind, uh, whether it will come to mind uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the next presidency is, how long should we accept that Iran has a permanent sanctuary while it does these, uh, un these uh, uh, violent and, and destabilizing actions in the Middle East? So it matters, as we were saying earlier, about the quality of diplomacy in what we do, but it also matters in the quality of diplomacy what we choose not to do. And we chose not to do uh, uh, these things in the 2010s, uh, which are now haunting us today. That brings us to the topic, you know, we've been, we've been dancing around it for some time now in this conversation of deterrence and whether or not we as a country know how to even to talk about deterrence anymore. It's almost, it seems to me like, that we did deterrence back during the Cold War, but we talked about that in terms of nuclear deterrence, or um, you know, we, we had some something of a language. But when we see crises coming our way now, it's almost as if we we spend more time talking about all the things we're not going to do, so that we give our adversaries, you know, a sort of maximum running space to do all of those things. Or, or operate in the, in the space. So nobody has to guess anymore whether all options are on the table. Are we in kind of a post-deterrence uh, 
foreign relations world now in as far as how our political conversation goes? Uh, well, no, in the sense that deterrent, the logic of deterrence, of course, still obtains, which is to say, if a country believes that the costs of its actions are likely to be higher than the benefits, uh, it is unlikely to undertake that activity. So how do you do that? Well, you either make it believe that it's going to suffer punishment that will exceed the benefit it gets from doing this thing that it would like to do, or that it will be unsuccessful in carrying out that activity, right? So that logic's still pretty strong and still animates the way a lot of leaders make their decisions. Um, but to your point, it's a cognitive effect, right? You're trying to uh, put into the, the mind of your would-be adversary that either he will be will suffer costs so great as to make it foolish to undertake that activity or that'll be unsuccessful. And when you start telling him all the things that he won't suffer as a result of that, you can understand the reasons for saying that because there are multiple audiences for these kinds of announcements. And you're trying to reassure people that things won't get out of hand and you're trying to send a message to people that, you know, you want to keep this uh, limited and things like that, but it it uh, it erodes uh, the cognitive effect that you're trying to have uh, when you tell your adversary all the things he does not need to worry about if he goes ahead uh, with his steps anyway. So the logic's still there. We just tend to spend a lot of time nibbling away at the edges of the effect. If we talk about this, and it was mentioned earlier. Uh, I think uh, we should be aware that presidential election years are not the best time to have uh, brilliant uh, diplomatic initiatives or risk taking. Uh, there is no president, at least in uh, my experience, uh, that uh, when confronted with an international issue says uh, to his team, well, I'm not going to consider domestic politics when I make my decision as I run for re-election. He says that to the public, but not to his team. And uh, I've had the experience where, I've worked three times at the White House, where a president had two meetings one in the White House Situation Room, where all of the experts like ourselves would get together and talk about what to do. And then the president would get up from the basement, walk up the stairs into the Oval, and there was a different team in the Oval. And uh, they had a different conversation. So I think both China uh, and especially uh, President Biden wants to avoid a, con a confrontation uh, this year uh, for obvious reasons. But it may be that uh, the Chinese have calculated this themselves and believe it's safer uh, for the next uh, ensuing months to uh, be more defiantly provocative uh, uh, near uh, the Philippines. Uh, and none of us know what the president will do if it escalates. None of us do. Uh, so uh, I think if we discuss this strategically, as we have been doing, uh, it is, uh, there's no reason to be uh, intrinsically pessimistic about America's capacity to do what needs to be done with respect to China and our other uh, commitments uh, in Europe and the Middle East. Uh, we have the power to do that. We have the allies to do that. Of course, we have difficult uh, domestic uh, currents. Uh, do we think that Harry Truman had a smooth ride in uh, uh, reestablishing the U.S. commitment to Europe after all the troops had come home? And so forth. There is no American president who doesn't have to explain to the American people why we're acting uh, the way we are abroad. 
So as we get to 2025 and uh, and uh, uh, whoever is president then, uh, we have the power and uh, the potential political will to do what's necessary. Will we do it? Uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche said man's most enduring stupidity is forgetting what he is trying to do. We're particularly expert at that. But uh, there is also in this particular case, uh, the Chir Churchillian theorem that goes like this. America always is very late in recognizing and dealing with far-reaching external challenges, comma, but never too late. Well, we'll see whether this is another example that we're not too late. And it does finally raise the question, how serious a country are we? We know what this threat is. There's a broad consensus. Will we continue to be uh, 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 tried and true in rhetoric and impoverished in action? Because if we do, then the American ordinary citizen is going to pay the price down the road for sure. And China will have increasing success in upturning this order that produced so much peace and prosperity around the world, uh, beginning in the United States. Well, maybe we'll wrap up on this last question. You, you call for your book for equilibrium in the Indo-Pacific and that we should continue to deal with China uh, on things where we can cooperate. In a recent article in Foreign Affairs, there was a view from Matt Ponger and Mike Gallagher that we have to achieve some sort of total victory, which I guess means regime change. Uh, I just guess, I take it you disagree with that analysis and equilibrium is the way to go and more realistic? The objective of our China policy should stem from the world we want to see, given China's ability to alter the world we want to see. And the world we want to see is one that is embedded in a rules-based order that reflect liberal democratic preferences to the greatest degree possible, uh, an open economic system, uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty and so forth. Um, and so the objective of our China policy should ultimately be to ensure that China is either unable or unwilling to overturn the regional and global orders. And there's various scenarios in which that could happen. Uh, you could imagine that the United States and its allies are strong enough and coordinated enough to make it impossible for China to do that. You could imagine that at some point the Chinese uh, w governed by whatever uh, government actually sees some benefits for China in uh, the way things are arranged and is less inclined to overturn them. But, the, but that objective, which is ultimately the objective that would matter the, mo the most to Americans and therefore worthy of pursuit, doesn't automatically require regime change in China. And if we were to announce and to pursue a a policy of regime change in China. One, you would have to attach a probability to that outcome. How likely do we think it is that through some expression of American power, we're going to topple the Chinese Communist Party and something else will take its place? Um, our track record of such endeavors is not exactly stellar. And then two, which allies would join us in the, in the endeavor? Um, because ultimately, the measure of this contest is not China on one side and the United States on the other. It's the United States and its allies and partners on one side and China and whatever allies and partners it can muster. And there, that is one of our greatest assets is the ability to work with countries like Japan and South Korea and Australia and the Philippines and increasingly with India and others in common pursuit. The best way to alienate those and make sure that they don't join us would be to announce that we're on a campaign to topple the government in China um, rather than to secure the blessings of the order that has produced peace and prosperity for so long. So uh, 
perhaps that's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, I think we disagree with our friends who, and they are our friends and we have great respect for them as thinkers and, and servant and public servants. Well, the book is Lost Decade, The U.S. Pivot to Asia and the Rise of Chinese Power. The authors are Ambassador Robert Blackwell and Richard Fontaine. Gentlemen, it has been fascinating. It has been enlightening. And here's hoping that there are a lot of people who will read this and take it to heart. Well, Jim, uh, you know, that's that was fascinating in part because we lived the so-called pivot to Asia. We were there. Uh, we were waiting for it. I was here in Hanoi during the uh, the island building campaign in the South China Sea during, uh, you know, 2013 to 2016. Um, you know, of course, we had the the uh, the confrontation at Scarborough Shoal in 2012. Uh, we were down in Australia for part of the pivot that did seem to happen, which was the deployment of U.S. Marines up to Darwin. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this was this was kind of a personal one for me. I mean, I, I, I think a lot of us were kind of waiting. Oh, and of course, the 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 failure of Trans-Pacific Partnership. So there's so many elements of this that we kind of got to see up, up close and personal. Indeed, I spent 2010 through uh, first half of 2016 working on Indonesia, especially in Southeast Asia in general. And, uh, you know, we had President Obama who spent a lot of his childhood in Indonesia. And there was, there was great excitement that there was going to be more of a focus on Asia. But in point of fact, as, as Richard and Bob point out, the, the rhetoric and the action didn't quite match. And that leads me to my story of the day. So uh, I was heading up the economic section of Embassy Jakarta and uh, Indonesia had a huge need for additional electricity generation. And they kept buying these old Chinese coal-fired power plants that would come down and not be very efficient. Um, and so I went to see the head of the electricity monopoly and say, why, why don't you ever buy some American new high-tech, cleaner burning uh, projects? He said, Jim, you know what? When the Chinese come in, they say, you want a power plant? Okay, you got a power plant. How much you want? All right, here's what's going to cost you. We'll build it. We'll deliver it. Here's when we'll be here. With you Americans, GE comes in one day and says, you want to buy a turbine? And Export Import Bank comes in and says, hey, if you ever want a, uh, a loan, you let us know, but uh, we're not going to help you design it. I don't have time for all that. So when you can come in and deliver me a power plant where I just have to sign and you can finance it, and have it all cheaper than the Chinese, you let me know. P.S. We never built anything. Um, so uh, even today, we have a huge trouble competing on this front, even while we don't have a trade policy for Asia. So Yeah, no, I mean, that's, in the end, you know, we are a market economy, right? And we are not, we don't, we try not to do industrial policy just because it's it's so it, it's so damaging to a market economy. Um, but if we don't do the other things that help the market economy thrive, like have trade deals, like you know think strategically about you know international trade and these kinds of things, then we don't have anything. We're not offering anything at that point. I mean, what we should be offering is. You know, U.S. ingenuity and and uh, uh, the the way that we we, we approach you know, our our our, our uh, innovation and the 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 uh, the energy that comes out of the U.S. market, and of course, you know, opening the U.S. market to to international trade gives us huge influence in so many of these places, um, and so that's what we're supposed to bring. We don't have the ability to just you know. I, I remember being in 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 vietnam and when we had some issues with uh china interrupting their um uh oil and gas exploration and they said why don't you just tell exxon mobil to come over and, and because they won't mess with exxon mobil because they're a big american company and we'd have to explain that we actually don't get to tell exxon mobil what to do because we're you know we're democracy and a market economy and all these things but you know, if we were to have an actual trade policy that mirrored our strategic concerns, then maybe we could, you know, let that 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 great American market 
uh, economy loose, and uh, and and we would have that that soft power moving forward. But when we're just hiding behind Fortress America, it's not working out. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, the fact is, we still have low tariff rates. Most countries are within uh, World Trade Organization, uh, most favored nation status. So we're still a pretty open economy, as a matter of fact. But you know, a lot of it is signals and st- and strategy and assurance that things aren't going to change, so investors know where to invest, and that's where we're we're failing. Um, We've tried to adjust our investment uh, from government assistance through things like the startup of the Development Finance Corporation, um, through programs through the Quad and with the Japanese to do this investment, but it's it remains slow, sort of ad hoc, and we have a real hard time competing with Chinese simplicity. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway. uh, so Jim, I'm, I, I'm going to leave this thing with a complaint, which is that your story wasn't very funny. And uh, we try to usually end these things on a light note. So um, we're going to have to we're going to have to make fun of you or something uh, just to just to close this out. Um, so next time, Jim, come you, you're going to have to come with a comedy because we, we, we can't we can't end these things on a downer. I, I can wear a funny hat. <laughs> we tried that. All right. Uh, yeah. We've gone on a long time. Uh, Jim, it's always good to see you. Uh, next time we talk, I think I'll probably be in Manila uh, as the great Asian tour of, of the summer of 2024 continues. Um, for uh, Jim Caruso, I'm Ray Powell. And a shout out to our great producer, Ian. Uh, we will see you soon on our next edition of Why Should We Care About the Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific.